on prime crime. How do you pick the ones that you think you're gonna kill? Depends on how I'm not. The story of one of America's most infamous murderers. Because he did this same MO over and over again, he got very good at it. His own words on the killings. Did you have any conversation with her? My mind was on killing her. And hear from the people who sat across from evil. I'll never in my life ever interview another killer like that in my career. Pluck me another grape. Uh huh. <laughs> I said, I mean, grapes, so y'all got on to find him. Hey there, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Prime Prime. This is where we do a deeper dive into the most high profile and memorable true crime cases. Our next story is about a killer so renowned, we had to dedicate two shows to this case. Here is part one. In 1970, a woman is strangled to death and buried in a shallow grave out in Florida. From there, for the next 35 years, bodies would be found across different states. No connection, no prime suspect. It would take decades before these cases would be solved and finally connected to one man. She was pretty, a light skinned brown, honey colored skin. This is Samuel Little, also known as Samuel McDowell. I met her in, in a, a, a nightclub in New Orleans. So I cut off, I took off the exit, went, and that sure enough was the road leading me into the woods. <laughs> and we went in and parked. He may not look like much when investigators began interviewing him in 2018, in his late 70s and suffering from health conditions. But the man you're seeing was the most prolific serial killer in United States history. I grabbed up my legs and pulled up to the water. Mm -hmm. That's the only one that I ever killed by drowning. That's just one confession of many that Little provided to authorities after his capture at the then age of 71. I'll never in my life ever interview another killer like that in my career. You know, you first see him, he's this little old man in a wheelchair that, that will remind me of a little old man on a porch, rocking in a chair, telling you his stories about his life. Although his stories were demented. North Little Rock, tell me what that girl looked like. Oh man, I loved her. She was a heavy set, big old yellow girl. And had buck teeth. <laughs> it had a gap between the teeth everywhere. She's too big for me to carry, carry her. So I just pulled out of the car and laid on that trash that was lit there. There was no remorse whatsoever. It was a matter of fact. I got him to kill. He went into great detail in his crimes. Oh, the only thing I know in all is that I killed him. And that was your intent? That was my intent. Sam Little ultimately confessed to 93 murders from 1970 to 2005. That's more than Ted Bundy, the Zodiac Killer, and the Golden State Killer combined. We know of at least 93 women who were murdered. He was not going to stop. He actually told police that he found it sexually satisfying to rape and kill women. In order to really understand Sam Little's reign of terror, let's first dig into the killings themselves. Like many serial killers, Sam Little had an M.O. Did you ever shoot any of these girls? Shoot? Yeah. With a gun? <laughs> Did I get no kick out of shooting? All right. So everything was done by manual strangulation. Did you ever use like a, a belt or a cloth or no anything? No garrets and all that. No, no ligatures at all? My hands. Just your hands? And without that, I wouldn't want to do it. He would take his hands and he would put them on their throats and he would choke them and sometimes he would allow them to uh, revive so he could see the fear in their eyes before choking them out finally. It was squeezing hard enough for the breath could be cut off and sooner or later she gonna start wanting to catch her breath and that's when she tried to pull my hands off. It was too late then. Mm -hmm. Was it exciting to you at the time? Yes, it was. He's a sadistic killer for sure. He wanted to feel like their neck swallowing. And I think his foreplay, basically, he would take a lot of them to eat, and they would go eat and swallow and drink. And I think that was his foreplay. That's what got him excited, was watching that neck. 
So how was it that Little was able to commit dozens of rapes and murders without getting caught? The reason Sam Little went undetected for so many years is because of who he targeted, primarily drug addicted women and sex workers. He didn't know who the hell was doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go back to the same city sometimes and uh -huh. pluck, pluck me another grape. Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, I mean, great, so y'all got on the vine here. Yeah. Sure. That one, right? Okay. There's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, take yeah that. a good one. So basically, these were women nobody would miss. He knew which women would be not cared about. He knew which women would not be missed. He knew which women would be susceptible to his advances, either whether they're romantic or he was providing them drugs or providing them alcohol. She, she was a hoe, yeah. She was a hoe. Oh, she was trying to make some money now. He knew which women on the lower levels of our society he could actually lure into his car to take to a secluded place to quickly kill them in the dead of night where nobody could see them, and then to dump their body immediately and get out of Dodge. This is how he got away with it. And I'm not just saying, he says it. Mama, you didn't get in out there with the people that would be immediately missed yeah. and very important to either family or business or somebody. Yeah, you got pretty good at knowing which one. Well, I'm not going to go over there in the white neighborhood and pick out the little uh, mm -hmm. young teenage girl or mm -hmm. like the media's do. <laughs> you know? And that's how Little got away with it over and over again. And because he did this secret, because he did this same M.O. over and over again, he got very good at it. Coming up, Little had spent his life in and out of prison and had almost been captured before. So what happened? I've been lucky on a numerous times. Yeah. I wanted to be in the back somewhere concealed. So she was already dead in the car? Yeah. Okay. After Samuel Little is arrested in 2012 on a narcotics charge, investigators realize he's actually responsible for several cold case killings. Little would ultimately confess to 93 murders. Prior to his capture, though, Little was a man who had been arrested almost 100 times and only spent a total of 10 years behind bars. So how is he not connected to these crimes sooner? And more importantly, how is he still on the streets for all this time? I was lucky in Florida. Mm -hmm. I had a dead body in the car. Mm -hmm. Back to get the joked out. Yes, and I'm getting ready. Boop, 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 blue lights everywhere. Police car and come back behind the building. He seen us park there. I jumped out the car and tried to act like I'm zipping my pants. He said, oh, what all the fun? What's going on over here? I said, nothing, nothing. Me and my wife just coming to the courts. Put the damn car looked in that window with a flashlight, I'm telling you. Shining right on the girl. She lay up there like that. And she's Got dead. Dead. Yeah. And as soon as he was looking in there, I said, yeah, I'm right uh, here. I tried, got his mind off of her. Just the nigga time before he took a second look. And I got away like that. He said, well, you got to get out of him. Wow. I got in the car and took off. The police weren't able to put together a strong case against him because he himself knew how to get away without leaving a lot of evidence. I never cut, stab, burn. Bit, but no, none of that. No blood. I don't like blood. He would initially strike his victims in the head and then strangle them. And I think ultimately, when you think about this, you're not going to have any forensic evidence later. The bodies have deteriorated, so there were no markings. There were no, you couldn't see knife wounds to bones. You could not see gunshot bullets. There was no fractures in these bodies. I'm not about pig farm or something. No. Uh, and that's how the girl, they found the girl that laying in the field next to the pig farm. All the mother in the off of the The rats got oh, to Sam Little would dispose of bodies in the Everglades. He would roll them down hills. He would put them in densely forested areas. He would let partially conceal by the vegetation and left for there. DNA didn't really start being utilized 
until the mid 1990s. So he was able to, to get away with any type of sexual crimes. Alabama did the same thing. I had this black chick up in the car, and um, uh, just got just got through killing them. That mother pulled up with his chair pulled up. Nobody ran the plate or anything like that. No, so they didn't, didn't put that on. He didn't run the plate. Mm -hmm. Nobody. No, he wasn't looking for no. They found the body, man, about a month later. Even though he had 100 arrests and served only 10 years prison time, I would blame partially the criminal justice system because a lot of the cases against him were dismissed. They weren't followed up with and he was fleeing constantly. He was very transient and leaving to different areas, cities across the nation. Little had had close calls before but nothing may have come as close as to when he was directly tied to two brutal murders. You know, we caught him. We believed he was responsible for Melinda Lucre's murder in 1982. And we know absolutely he was responsible for Patricia Mount's case. Now, when you're driving around with Patricia Mount in the front passenger seat, did you have any conversation with her? My mind was on killing her. She let me feel her throat, you know, caressing it. And before I knew it, I uh, tied my hands around it and strangled it up. After Patricia Mount's nude body was found in that hayfield, hair fibers and witness testimony linked Little to the killing, and he went on trial. Yet once again, it was Little's lucky day. The jury found him not guilty. As for Melinda LaPree, a grand jury opted not to indict him. Other media has come to us saying, you know, if y'all had just tried him and he was in jail, all these people would be alive. And I will tell you that Melinda Lupree had been out in the elements for over three weeks. Um, and if you saw a picture of, the, of, of her remains, you would understand there were no evidence there to gain. There were so many things, so many times that uh, he was arrested for, for assaulting women. And the women were ladies of the night. They were on, on drugs. And those don't make the best witnesses, unfortunately. A combination of lack of hard evidence, issues with witnesses, and Little's own ways of covering up his crimes resulted in weak cases and him continually striking plea deals for shorter prison stints. Jillian Lauren, a New York Times best-selling author and someone who spent hours interviewing Sam Little, has made it her mission to be the voice of these victims. Because of um, the fact that they were often prostitutes, often drug addicts, often women of color, um, women who were considered unimportant, or as some cops used to talk about the women who were turning up in South Central dead almost every morning in the 80s. Um, uh, NHI, no humans evolved. But you know, it, it wasn't just cops. He was tried by a jury of his peers. Once again, it's us who let him go. Up next, Little's crime spree comes to an end, but his story is just beginning. I had desire, strong desire, to f her and kill her. And she played with you a little bit on the way out there, and you killed her in the car. Yes, I would try it for it. You beat it, too. <laughs> Samuel Little, who's come to be known as the most prolific serial killer in United States history and whose crime spree spanned from 1970 to 2005, was able to elude justice for years. That is, until 2012. The prosecutors and the police were never able to actually pin a case on him until he left his DNA. California actually had a case where they had run DNA on a cold case and uh, they had an identical case or one that was a uh, similar MO, and when they tested that DNA, the DNA came back to an identical person in Sam Little. In September 2012, Little was arrested in a homeless shelter in Kentucky on an outstanding California drug charge. When he was extradited back to LA, investigators such as Detective Mitzi Roberts were able to link Little's DNA to material left at crime scenes in the 1980s. I was already putting together a Sam Little case because I was working all the cold cases here in my area in Mississippi, uh, Los Angeles, Mitch Roberts called asking, do we have anything about a Sam Little case? So she came down, interviewed our witnesses to put together a, a method, uh, an, an MO of, of the killer Sam Little. 
uh, it fit everything with their cases. In 2014, Little was convicted of the murders of three of his victims, Carol Alford, Audrey Nelson, and Guadalupe Apodaca. But in a way, Little was also answering for all the women he had killed. They were human beings and that they were all totally different. They're you. In September 2014, Little was sentenced to three consecutive life terms in prison without the possibility of parole. While Little had maintained his innocence his whole life, in 2018, he finally decided to open up to investigators. What's up, man? It's so good to meet you, and I'd like to personally thank you uh, for being generous enough with your time. I hope I can clear up some of you. When somebody is incarcerated and they know they're spending their life in jail, their communication with the outside world is, in essence, gone. You're so valuable to society at this point, you, I think. Well, I'm a, I'm worth something to these yeah. people. I thought it was a worthless thing to them. You were saying that I'm worth something. He opened up because it was his exit strategy. This was, again, part of his overall plan. This guy definitely was ready to talk as soon as he knew that he wasn't going to be receiving the death penalty. That's the letter that you requested, that uh, our state attorney will not pursue the death penalty under any circumstances. Now the question became, how do you get Little to open up? Well, I'd love to talk to you about Gainesville a little bit. You know, that's that's where I live well, and I'm, work. I'm, so. I'm, not a, I'm not a Gator fan, I'll tell you right now. You must be Ohio State. That's right. You, you know what Urban did for our Gators, though. Big Ohio State <laughs> Yeah. Now you were a USC fan too, or no? No, no. no. I, I can't stand California fans. Uh -oh. <laughs> but you lived out in California for a while. I've lived there several times. It's going to be Little's interview for sure. I wanted to make sure that myself, as a prosecutor, was uh, going to be somebody that he wouldn't mind talking to. We knew that he liked the Cleveland Browns. He's from the Cleveland area. We're from the Cleveland, and so that kind of. Uh, was our cash, if you will, uh, to be able to build this report with him. What do you remember about it? Talking <laughs> shit. Talking <laughs> How I did it, I talked to him straight. I told him he was a big perv. I told him I didn't agree with him. He would say, would you call me a perverted homicidal maniac? And I said, well, that's like certainly one of the things I'd call you. And he was just like, whatever, you're a hoe. I was mostly kind of honest with him. Coming up, Little may have confessed to numerous murders, but how do we know if he was telling the truth? More when we return. Think all court shows are the same? We're talking about your father. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Think again. Judge Caprio rules with common sense. I was having contractions. I was rushing to the hospital. Inspector Quinn, what does justice demand? Jail? <laughs> and compassion. I'm going to take the circumstances into consideration. The best court experience I've had. Clearly, Judge, he's been in a court before. Get caught in Providence. Hi, I'm Dan Abrams. In the exploding legal and true crime genre, Law & Crime is the only network that has it all. Good evening and welcome. This is a complicated case. Don't really jump to conclusions. Welcome to Prime Crime Tonight, another day of drama between both sides. From multiple live trials daily to original and compelling programming, the Law & Crime Network is everywhere, and we invite you inside the jury box. This is Law & Crime. The only thing I did was one was strangled. Some lived and some didn't. After serial killer Samuel Little was finally caught in 2012 and convicted of murdering three women back in the 1980s, he decided to confess to more of his crimes from 1970 to 2005. And that's when the floodgates opened. So I killed a girl there. In Ocala? Gangster. I killed a girl over there in Ocala, too. You also talked about a uh, young lady that you dumped out a stairwell? Yeah, a white girl. That was a white girl? Yeah, she was white. I got her out of the car, pulled her out, and drug her into the groups back then. Little ended up confessing to killing 93 people and would ultimately plead guilty to several more murders. How do we know, though, 
that Little was actually telling the truth. I absolutely believe in his credibility of the stories that he told. He knew everything about my crime in 1982. And then the 1977 remains actually had a wig on. Nobody knew that but the anthropologist and us. And he talks about she had a wig and he threw it out the window after he killed our, our, our very first victim. In one other case, he was able to tell what the last item that a lady had eaten was basically the carrots out of a salad and brown coffee. And the autopsy report shows undigested carrots and brown coffee. And that also was from the 70s. But it would have been dark for you, so I don't know how these pictures can really help you. No. I don't, that must be the blanket. Yes. Yeah. That's the blanket. How did you remember that? It was also important what Little said he didn't do. We were all sitting around talking, and, and the detective says, yeah, you know, he, he killed mine. He drew a picture of her, and I said, what year was yours? And he said, 1998. I said, no, nope. when I'm saying, look. I said, he was not out in 1998. So when they go into the interview room, and this detective is starting to talk to him about that case, and, and I'm thinking, golly, if Sam Little confesses to killing this one, that's going to throw this whole story in the, in the in the brink. I mean, it just, none of it's going to be true. And, you know, he looked at it, he goes, oh, yeah, I'm never home. Oh, yeah. But I didn't kill that one. He said, I was going to kill her. He said, I came back to kill her. But she was gone. I couldn't find her. Then I said, "Well, Sam could have took credit for one, did not." And um, and so they told me he's not out there just just trying to get numbers. He's out there wanting to talk about his cases. Now we get a sense of his killings, but what drove Sam Little? Did choking with these women happen before the sex, or during, or at, right afterwards? When did it mostly happen? I choose. I picked. I choose her out first. You pick the ones that you think you're going to kill. No, no, if you want, it depends on how I'm net. So clearly a lot more to talk about. And in part two of our Sam Little story, we're going to get into his background in psychology, why he stopped killing, and also whether Little is responsible for more murders than we know about. So that's all we have for you right now on Prime Crime. But leave us your comments on Instagram and Twitter with the hashtag Prime Crime. As always, thank you for joining us. And until next time, be safe.